Lynn Hiles Ministries presents That You Might Have Life. He said he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. So Jesus came that we might have life. The Bible said in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The more light you have, the more life you're going to have. So you can have peace. Was only, that's why it's called the gospel of peace. He took your punishment so you could get his peace. He took what you had coming so you could get what he has coming. All around the country and around the world, people just like you are awakening to the good news of Jesus Christ. What God wanted to do was release the kingdom of God in your life until the joy and the peace and the righteousness of the Holy Ghost would so fill your life. I don't want to just make heaven my home. I want to make my home like heaven. And now, here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Which is a virgin going to have a baby? Next Sunday, there's no news flash about a virgin having a baby. A month later, CNN hadn't run any stories on a virgin having a baby. Oh, I'm just paraphrasing. Just, just stay with me. I'm having fun. A year later, no virgin, no baby. Now we're thinking about burning the tape. Right. <laughs> Maybe we ought to quit releasing that. Wished I wouldn't have sent it out on tape of the month. Seven years later, no virgin, no baby. Ten. Not a thing. It looks like you're a false prophet. Now everybody's calling you a false prophet. Now you're calling, now they're calling you the cult uh, yeah. in southwest Oklahoma. There you go. <laughs> Are you the cult from Fiji? Them folk down there believe funny because everybody don't believe like you think you're a cult. <laughs> yeah. oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Twelve, fifteen years. This man dies, steps over into the balconies of glory, lives and dies not seeing that prophetic word come to pass. 700 years later, a virgin girl bows in pain, gives birth to seven pounds of God in the flesh. Isaiah leaned over the balconies of glory and high-fived Ezekiel and says, and it came to pass in those days. And before they could lay seven pounds of God in the flesh in a corrupted priesthood and a dead religious system like a streaking quarterback to intercept a pass, uh, or a linebacker to intercept a pass from a quarterback, Simeon, whose name means hearing, steps up and intercepts this pure thing. Before a religious thing can get it, a hearing people get a hold of it. A Simeon comes on the scene. Somebody who's hearing from God who said to him, you better get up and go to the temple today because God's about to do what he promised you. Uh, he didn't get a fax. Uh, nobody sent him an email. He didn't see it on CNN. The Holy Ghost said, get up and go to the house of God. Uh, I'm about to show up like I've never showed up before. You're about to hold this holy thing. He holds seven pounds of God in the flesh. And the Bible says, and coming in that instant, Anna, whose name means grace, because when he shows up, grace comes in an instant. When he comes on the scene, law fades and grace comes on the scene. Hallelujah. And grace comes on the scene and she's there. She's there to intercept this holy thing. Oh, I ain't going to get done this morning. But behind a 10 by 10 by 10 curtain, there's an old gal named Mercy. She's pacing behind the veil. She's been locked up for 1,500 years, and Mercy wants to get free. She's been imprisoned by a four-inch curtain, a thick veil. She wants to get loose on the human family, but Mercy couldn't get free. One time a year, a high priest would come and throw blood of a bull or goat in Mercy's face, and all that did was keep judgment bound. It never set Mercy free, and she heard the cry of that seven pound baby and she looked over and said I think that's the one that's going to set me free 12 years later Mercy is still pacing she's in her 10 by 10 by 10 prison Mercy needs to get loose on the human family and while she's there behind the curtain she hears these words, young man, where have you been? We've missed you for three days. Mercy said, oh yeah, I've been missing you for three days too. 
That's a real revelation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he says, Mama, don't you know I must be about my father's business? Mercy said, that's him. And she kept on pacing. She paced for another, what, something like 18 years. And all of a sudden, he walks back in the temple. He's 30. He's about to preach his first public message. He leans over and says to the attendant, go get me the book of Isaiah. Isaiah leans over the balconies of glory and says, he's going to preach from my notes this morning. <laughs> Isaiah said to Zeke, I wrote that. Oh, somebody help me preach up in here. How I many sometimes you may look like a fool for a while, but somewhere God will vindicate the word of the Lord that was spoke out of your mouth. Somewhere God will confirm it. How I many of he himself preached from the text? He stood up in the temple of God. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Because if you ever preach the real gospel to the poor, they won't be poor anymore. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Now listen, what's the venue he's in? He's in the temple. Because who's more brokenhearted than folk who walked down a church aisle and traded one set of stress and problems for another one? And they thought they got reality, but all they got was religion. And now they're more disappointed and frustrated because they thought they turned to what they thought was God, and all they got was religion. But somewhere, somebody stands up and says, he's anointed me to bind up some brokenhearted folk. Uh, he sent me to heal the bruised. Come on. Folk that are hurting inside. Uh, he sent me to, come on, uh, set at liberty them that are bruised uh, and to preach to the captives. Folk in religious bondage. Uh, he said he closed the book and he didn't preach like their scribes. He leaned back. He said, ladies and gentlemen, this is not some glad morning. Uh, it's not in the sweet by and by. Uh, it's not after a while somewhere. This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears because I am the year of jubilee. I am the Sabbath day. I'm a compound of Sabbaths. And when you get in me, your bondage is over. Your bruising is over. Woo, hallelujah. And mercy started to pucker up. She's got that I'm going to kiss you look on her face because mercy and truth are about to kiss each other. Hey, glory to God. Hallelujah. Three and one half years later, she's still pacing. She's still walking the floor. He's standing in Pilate's judgment hall, and Pilate says, Are you the son of, I adjure you by God. You can't plead the Fifth Amendment. There is no Fifth Amendment back then. Are you the Son of God or not? And he said what he said to Moses at the burning bush. I am. And come on, hallelujah, and Caiaphas started to back up. He was one of the first ones ever almost got slain in the spirit. <laughs> and mercy said, I knew it. And before the weekend's over, I'm out of here. I feel the preacher on me this morning. They carried him, come on, hallelujah. They carried him to Pilate's judgment hall. Pilate said, this is innocent blood. He's qualified now as a spotless lamb. They pulled him tight like a canvas would stretch to paint a painting, stretched his muscle and sinew and beat his back until they pulled the flesh and bone from his body. If you saw the passion, it's a graphic thing. But I'm going to tell you, I'm not sure it even still does it justice. But every time I watch that, I don't view it as something that happened to one man 2,000 years ago. I view it as what I had coming, and he took, come on, not just for me, but as me. Uh, hallelujah. I was cruising for a bruising. Uh, hallelujah. I was the one that had it. Help me, Holy Ghost. I was in Atlanta, Georgia with uh, uh, Dr. T.L. Osborne, and I did a conference there, and, and, and he, he got up and spoke some things that was absolutely phenomenal about some miracles. But while he was preaching the text, he had pulled a text, and the Lord just started to talk to me. I'm not sure if he said it or if I heard it from the Holy Ghost. I, I, sometimes when somebody's talking, you know, you kind of get inspiration. You're not sure what all they said and what all God said. But all of a sudden, this, the Lord asked me the question, who has believed 
our report. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And I could see a vision of the arm and hammer baking soda box and God rolling up his sleeve said, who has seen the arm of the Lord revealed? And then he said to me, I raised up Pharaoh. I made him the biggest, the bad. I hardened his heart. And I did it so I could reveal my power. And he tells you later on, after he made Pharaoh the biggest and the baddest and the ugliest and the most powerful, God said, my right hand and my holy arm got me the victory. God was saying, even the worst, the biggest, the baddest, and the ugliest. Can I say it another way? He did it with one hand tied behind his back. All we have ever seen is God's arm. I wonder what would happen if his body ever got connected. I wonder if he ever turned both hands loose. Somebody help me a little bit. What if we ever saw his body in motion? What if his body ever came together? What if we could quit fighting? What if we could quit killing each other with our tongues? What if we could quit being suspicious of one another? Wonder if we could ever come on, hallelujah, come together. I'm telling you, I believe there's a people like Joseph of Arimathea that are begging the body of Jesus in this hour. We are begging for the body. Come on, the body must come together. Somebody's got to beg for the body. We got to get desperate enough that our need goes beyond our offenses. Because because if our need never gets bigger than my offense, I'll never embrace him. He said to me, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who will God show his power to? And I saw the arm and hammer back in the soda box. So I'm thinking about that. I said, well, Lord, who are you going to re reveal your arm to? He said, to those who believes the report. Now, I know that sounds simple. Listen a minute. Lord, who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? To, to them that believe the report. And so I said, well, what, what report is that? And then I went into the little song. We are healed. We are filled. We are, you know. And that's good. And the Lord said, that's not the report I'm talking about. I said, what report are you talking about? He said, read the rest of the chapter. He was wounded for your transgression. He said, until you understand that you had a beating coming, but I bore your beating. Not for you, but as you. I so identified with who you are in Adam that I took what you had coming in Adam so that you can get what I have coming in Christ. Oh, well, somebody ought to get happy about that. See, in Adam, the wages of sin were death, but the gift of God is eternal. Oh, somebody help me. Hallelujah. And he took what I had. He said, if you don't understand that he was wounded for your transgression, he was bruised for your iniquity. The chastisement for your peace was upon him because we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Every one of us have gone into our own path, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Until you realize that you've already got everything you deserved for your sin in Adam, in Christ, you will never set yourself up to receive the blessing of the arm of the Lord. And if you do not see that, you will be like Judas, who sits at the table of communion and eats the broken body of the Lord and drinks the blood and never discerns what it means. See, when you do it unworthily, it doesn't mean you got sin in your life and you came down. See, I used to think, this is a real laid back service this morning. I'm having a good time. I hope I'm making sense to you. But I used to, man, when it was communion service, even as a leader, can we talk? I'm thinking, communion Sunday came around, and I'm thinking to myself, I know what's going to happen. They're going to get up and say, if you've got sin in your life, get it right. Because if you eat this cracker and drink this grape juice, unworthily and then some of them terrorist preachers would hack they go ah, you're gonna bust hell wide open you got sin in your life you want to play with god on one side and you want the world on the other 
You want me to name sin? I'm going to name it for you this morning. Some of you women came in here with head levelers on your head. Makeup all over your Jezebel face. You got pantsuits on and a television set in your living room. Some of you eating devil's food cake. Devil eggs. You want to play with God. You want God on one side and play with the world on the other. You want to compromise. You got you to hack when you say that. And I'm thinking to myself on Communion Sunday, if that cracker going to take me to hell. <laughs> as a leader, I would find a reason not to make that service. So I'm thinking, you know, the cracker ain't worth it, man. If I'm going to hell, it's going to be at least a cheeseburger. <laughs> you know? I did communion. In, I did communion in Daytona Beach. Helped, helped the bishop serve communion in Daytona Beach. This little boy comes up, and we're taking And we got a big loaf of bread. We're tearing chunks off and giving it to him, you know? This little boy looks up at me. He says, is that all you got? <laughs> I said, I'm with you, kid, but beat it. <laughs> he said, I was thinking about a cheeseburger. I said, I am too, but this is all I got. Take it and go. <laughs> But I started thinking, you know, Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have any life in you. And I'm thinking, if I got to ink, drink, ink, eat his flesh and drink his blood in order to have life, but I can't do it unless I'm sinless and I ain't got a problem, then how in the world is this thing working? But how many of you don't eat his flesh? Come on. In other words, eating his flesh means not just taking a piece of bread, but discerning what the death of Christ exacted for you. And when you start to discern it, then you're not eating it unworthily because you realize that his death is what made you worthy. So that when you set up to the table, you understand his death exacted everything that I had coming so that I am accepted in the beloved. Hallelujah. And if I discern that, then I won't do what Judas did. Judas had the elements of communion in his belly, did not discern the Lord's body. He has the price of redemption within his grasp, 30 pieces of silver. And he walks back to the temple. He throws it on the floor. He says to the high priest, I have betrayed innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? You see to it. And Judas went out and hanged himself. Do you know that Judas' name means praise? There is a praise that betrays. There is a spirit of a son of perdition that's not in the White House. It's in the church of God because it's a spirit that thinks that your dying and your hanging is redemptive. When in fact, if he would have waited three hours, the hanging of Jesus would have been his hanging because your hanging is not redemptive. I don't care how much you try to kill yourself. You can hang yourself. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something. There's a day I'm trying to get to my text about the Sabbath day. But I'm going to tell you they came to see whether or not the bodies were broken. And it says in the scripture, it says, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus, well, uh, uh, it says uh, uh, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation of the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day. For the Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. They came, but how many know Jesus was already, come on, deceased. Uh, and the Holy Ghost said to me, it is the Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. And nobody ought to be on the cross on the Sabbath day. This day that we're in is not a day of live dying. You're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. I, I'm not preaching to Adam to die. I'm preaching to people in Christ to live. I, I want to hallelujah. I came that you might have life. It's not about dying. It's about operating in the power of resurrection. There's a revelation that must come to us of a death that's accomplished. If we don't understand it's finished, it'll never shake our Babylonian thinking. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Can I say this to you? John the Revelator is on an island called Patmos. He's there for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Greek word testimony there is the Greek word martyrdom. He said, I was on an island called Patmos. To quote my sources, a book called Proper Names of the Bible by J.B. Jackson tells me that the word Patmos means my killing. Oh, hear this a minute. John said, I was on an island called my killing to get a revelation of the martyrdom of Jesus Christ. Now, I used to, when the first time I ever preached the book of Revelation, I preached God will put you on an island called Patmos. 
to kill you. Because that's the level of understanding that I had then. Until I realized the finished work and the preaching of the cross is the key to everything. That my death was accomplished in him. I identify with that. I go back and feed on that. I eat the lamb. I, I, I understand that. See, what I do is when I feed on that, what I'm hoping happens is that the more I understand that his death was my death, that one morning folks are going to believe that. They're going to throw their feet out of the bed one morning, and they're going to say, how can we who are dead to sin live any longer in it? See, as long as you're dying, you've got an excuse. As long as you've got Adam to blame, you've got a scapegoat. As long as the devil's your problem, you've got a reason. But how many know when you realize it's been accomplished, uh, he took you and everything you used to be, he nailed you to Golgotha's hill, he buried you. Come on, I feel like Joseph of Arimathea. I'd been digging for years. How many know Joseph of Arimathea, before he begged for the body, he must have been digging a long time. If you're digging your own tomb out of rock, man, you're out there every day with a pick and a shovel and, 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 and a chisel when you're there. What are you doing, Joseph? Man, I, I'm, dig, I, I'm dying out. I'm trying to bury my old man. Oh, somebody help me. Man, he did it for a long, I mean, you don't, you're talking about if he dug a tomb out of rock, man, he spent his whole life preparing to die. And when he went and begged the body of Jesus, and he's about to put Jesus in his own new tomb, he's knowing something. He's knowing that if I identify with that death, then I ain't going to need this tomb. Because his death is my death. And I'm going to take his body laid in my new tomb, and I'm going to live in the power of resurrection. I wish somebody had get happy with me. Come on, sometimes we've been dying way too long, but I'm going to tell you something that the book of Revelation says, blessed are the dead. Touch somebody say, he's talking to you right now. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. Yes. When did you die? You died in the Lord. Somebody said to me, you want to go to Israel? I said, done been there. When? I thought they killed me there 2,000 years ago. Because I was in him just like I was in Adam. Come on, I was in Adam just like a branch is in the vine. But I'm in, I'm not in Adam and in Christ. Uh, hallelujah. I died with him. And come on, when I got up from the dead, I got up with him. I, I'm in the book. I was crucified with Christ. I was quickened with him. I've been raised with him so that I'm now free to live in the newness of resurrection. So, so when John is on an island called My Killing, he said, I was there for the testimony of Jesus Christ, the martyrdom of Jesus Christ. He said, I was there to get a revelation of what more happened than just history. Yeah. See, anybody can show you a movie, but see, if you can see beyond the graphic details and see what was happening in the, oh, hallelujah, in the realm of spirit, one of the highlights to the movie to me, first time i ever seen the movie, The Passion, I was in Yuma, Arizona, and when he fell under the weight of that cross, and his mama was standing over there weeping, and he looks over at his mama, and he says to her, see, mom? I make all things new. I'm going to tell you it's all I could do to not stand up and say, you all don't understand, but I got to preach here about 10 minutes. Uh, I got that little jerk up on me in that theater. You know what I mean? I was throwing popcorn. Hey, hallelujah. I thought when I get that movie, I'm going to own that bad boy, and I'm going to pause it. Uh, and when they're done beating him, I'm going to ask anybody if they feel like God wants to heal them because he was wounded for your transgression. Uh, he was bruised uh, for your iniquity. The chastisement for your peace uh, was laid on him. Hallelujah. By whose stripe we are healed. We all like sheep. He made his grave with the wicked. But he will see his seed. He will prolong their days. The Lord looked down from Calvary. God looked down and saw not one man, but all men. And he said, I have seen the travail of his soul. What's your name? Ralph? He said, I've seen the travail of his soul, and I am satisfied that Ralph got everything he deserved because your name, Isaiah said, was inscribed on the palm of his hand. He put the nail right on top of your name. He nailed you 2,000 years ago. He got rid of who you used to be. 
I said he got rid of who you used to be. And if you're still living in Adam, it's because you're believing a lie. And you've lost your identity. And you don't know who you are. Hey, but I'm here to draw to your remembrance. Uh, I want to stir up your pure mind. Uh, I want to put you in remembrance. Uh, I want you to look and live. I want you to understand uh, that if you get a revelation of his martyrdom, Listen to what John says. He was said, I was on an island called my killing to get a revelation of his death. Listen to this. He said, then I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet. All of a sudden, John realizes my killing's not in front of me. My killing's behind me. Oh, come on with me. Hallelujah. He heard, come on, a sound like a trumpet. A trumpet came from a ram's horn. A ram's horn comes from the death of a male lamb. He said, when I heard a message come long and loud through the death of a male lamb, I realized my killing's not in front of me. Oh, this, if you're saving your shout for after a while, you might ought to use it up pretty soon. Uh, hallelujah, my killing is not in front of me. My killing is behind me. John said, I turned to see a voice. Uh, and when I did, he said, I found myself in the day of the Lord. I entered into a rest. Uh, I entered into a Sabbath day where nobody ought to be on the cross on a Sabbath day. Hallelujah. When we believe that report. See, we, have, we teach people to have faith in faith. If you believe harder. See, what we're doing is believing and believing. We've got to believe the report. What report? He was wounded for my transgression. See, because I promise you, every time folk get in a prayer line to get healed, the first thing happens to them is they start thinking about whatever sin they've done. They get in a hospital bed on their deathbed. I've had people say to me, Brother House, I know you're a prophet. If God shows you any sin in my life that's holding me back from getting healed, let me know. Prayed with a woman in Missouri on her deathbed. 60, oh, she was probably 70, upper 70s. Been to church all of her life, faithful saint of God. Wednesday, Sunday, she cooked, she cleaned, she did everything. She says to me, Brother House, pray for me that in my dying moments I won't foul up, have an evil thought, and miss heaven. I said, if 60 years in church has produced that, we're doing something wrong. She should have high-fived me and said, I have fought me a good fight. I have kept the faith. Therefore, there's laid up for me. She, said, she, said, she should have said to me, I'm about to storm the gates of glory. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. But see, what we've done is we've taught... Thanks for taking the time to join our broadcast today. This program has been made possible through the generous donations of our partners around the world. If you'd like to partner with us, please send your tax-deductible gift to Lynn Hiles Ministries, P.O. Box 127, Great Cacapon, West Virginia, 25422, or call us at 1-304-579-5336. Also, you can visit us online at www.lenhiles.com to view the large selection of books, CDs, and DVDs we have available. And until next time, remember in Christ, all of God's promises are yes and amen.